Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you back once again to Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist Got It Right, here on Liberty Works Radio Network, where liberty works for you. I just have to thank you in joining me again, your host, Tom Navolis, as we continue to look at what the Anti-Federalist, and in particular Samuel Adams, was concerned about when it came to maintaining our liberty. We're going to jump around a little bit today as we'll look at some of the developments prior to the, um, oh, the, 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 the Constitution. And then as we get into some of the things around the Constitution, uh, we'll look back and forth between the Anti-Federalists and, and Sam Adams. But what I want to relate it to today is something that goes back to two weeks ago is that lies matter. And lies do matter. We're, we're seeing in the modern press a lot that is coming out still again about Hillary Clinton. Uh, yeah, I'll call her Clinton because I meant the criminal Hillary Clinton. As to uh, people are now, even in the, the Democratic Party, distrust her. They're finding that uh, there's much that she has to say that is not trustworthy, especially when it comes to this whole issue of her uh, mail server and that being her email server, uh, and her associations, which extends even greater then into the idea of what our founders looked at when we look at foreign association. I'm also going to mix it up a little bit, not only with, uh, once again, looking at our Pope honoring the son of a Muslim terrorist um, who uh, is here in the United States, and that being the little uh, clickety-clock young man, and uh, that his family will be going to the White House after they pay their Islamic homage uh, to uh, Mecca, which, you know, under the, the, the peaceful religious perspective of people, that's fine that they do that and, and take care of their obligation. But this individual and uh, that whole family as it is reported over and over in the rest of the media, which I'm not going to get into that, is truly a jihadist ties to the Muslim Brotherhood and so on and so forth. So you could go reference that. But what I want to talk about in regards to that is, first off, is that the President of the United States is uh, a liar. There, there's just no other way to, to say that based on his associations, based on the people that he has in the White House, based on all of the ties and connections, he does not represent us, and he does not take into consideration what the intent of our Constitution is for the liberty of the people. He's a subversive, uh, there's, and it's proven over and over by what he is involved in, in particular, this Iranian deal as it's going through, in particular the different uh, uh, executive memos and such that he is perpetrating on the American people, and uh, Congress is allowing to happen, so they have their hand in the subversion that is being directed uh, by the President of the United States, and uh, so it's going to be very interesting. So what I'd like to do and that note is kind of uh, slide back a little bit into Samuel Adams' writings, and in particular what he wrote to Elbridge Gerry uh, regarding uh, George Washington being honored, uh, some of the issues that were going on with the organization that was happening after the war called the Cincinnati Club uh, Association. It, it just really wasn't a benefit to who we needed to be as a people. But after, uh, in this particular letter to Elbridge Gerry that uh, was written, oh, let's see, back in uh, 1784, and uh, Sam Adams sent it to Elbridge Gerry up into Boston, the real key element after he was talking about the, the Cincinnati group and, and then he was also talking about General Washington and you know what an honorable man he was, the virtue that he would bring into governance, so on and so forth, and then how he would deal with you know these organizations that potentially 
And the Cincinnati group, the Cincinnati organization, potentially could be detrimental to the, to the United States, this new country. So here's what he said, and Adams, and I'm quoting now, is, but there is a degree of watchfulness over all men possessed of power or influence upon which the liberties of mankind much depend. It is necessary to guard against the infirmities of the best as well as the wickedness of the worst of men. Such is the weakness of human nature that tyranny has oftener sprang from that than any other source. And, and, and what he's meaning is not from the wickedness as much as is from those that are, are well-meaning, those good men. And then he continues is that it, it, is, it is this that unravels the mystery of millions being enslaved by a few. So depending on who comes into power, the remainder of the people become enslaved. And that's what the American Revolution was, is that we were becoming enslaved not only through taxation, but also, which I'll diverge with, is economy and what is happening in commerce. So we see, and excuse me, I'm going to step away from the Elbridge Jerry for a moment, that yesterday, what happened? We had the president of China lands in Seattle and meets with all these national conglomerate leaders, most of whom are extremely leftists in everything they believe, especially on the, on the social order, but they're leftists only to their benefit. Are they what? Are, are they people that believe in free market? This was something that our founders were against against is that they saw the economics of the time being driven out of England by what? Oh, it was the what? The trading companies. It was that whole group of national and international economic leaders that were trying to enslave America and all of its resources. So once again, when we look at the Global corporations, and I'm a free market guy, I believe in all of that, but I have to tell you is that when you get these people in power and they start coming together in the ways that they do, then what we have is the likes of Common Core, so on and so forth, which actually lead then to the opportunities of slavery uh, for the rest of us. So if we step back into what Sam Adams was writing, it is this that unravels the mystery of millions being enslaved by a few. What was it that induced the, the Cincinnati gentlemen who have undertaken to deliberate and act upon matters which may essentially concern the happiness and future dignity of the American empire to admit foreign military subjects into their society? So here it was is that what happened with the Cincinnati Club is that they were actually allowing foreign officers to come in that had no ties to America, that did nothing in, in actuality to fight for America in the extent of the American Revolution to become a part of that society, not for reasons of saying, hey, this is a good old boys club, we're going to pat a bunch of military guys on the back, so on and so forth, but to have relationships in such a way that if they needed to pull the resources together of these foreign powers, they had that society together that could do that. So the, the Cincinnati Gentlemen's Organization, the Cincinnati Club, uh, I guess was the precursor to what we would call the Skull and Bones, to all these other so-called secret societies, but they weren't secret. They were quite open. And Adams just brings it out very clearly that this is an essential concern to the happiness and future dignity of America. And we see that over and over when you have, again, going back to the international stuff, and with these uh, groupings of international businessmen to the extent that they're looking out for their best interests and their companies. And, oh, yeah, the stockholder. So that's the false idea of people being in, general people being in the stock market. Because if you really look at who's in the stock market, you know what, the piddlings that you may have in there, uh, that's something. But really look at who the insurance companies are, the unions are, school districts, the states. All of those are people, organizations, entities that are really tied up 
and major players in the stock market. So the internationalists are playing to this whole other, uh, what do you want to call it? I don't know. I'll call it just this contrived economy that has nothing to do with our reality except the potentials of leading us into slavery. So, again, I'll stop with that for a moment. I'm not going to leave that alone because it all ties together. So what Adams continues on is, was, uh, was there not danger before a foreign influence might prevail in America? So we're seeing, where's that foreign influence? Do not foreigners wish to have weight in our councils? Wow, look at the lobbying groups that are going on in America today. A lot of the lobbying groups, even the terrorist lobbying groups, such as CARE, the other Islamist groups, as well as the other international groups, what are they? They want to have influence in our councils, our councils being Congress, the judiciary, and so on and so on. So what we have there is that they want this influence. Adams continues, can such a junction of subjects of different nations, and those nations widely differ in their principles of government, you hear that? So we got socialists, we have jihadists, we have Sharia, we have communists, all having influence right there in the White House because they are in the council of the president. All right, go do your homework. But here's what he continues to say, is that to deliberate upon the things which relate to the union and national honor. There it is, folks. The happiness and future dignity of one consists with sound policy. So it's really a question. Does all of this come together? Can that come together on the future happiness, on the happiness and future dignity with sound policy? Can it consist together? Can it come together? Are we sure that those foreign nations will never have separate views and very national and interest ones too, because they once united in the same object, and it was accidentally their mutual interest to fight side by side. And their interest was what? It wasn't for us. It wasn't for America. Overall, their interest, especially from an economic perspective, England had their separate separate interests. You know, Russia at that time had its separate interests. There was Poland. There was Germany. It was all of Europe, France, even as an ally, had its separate interest. So when we look at all of these foreign entities, and when we look at all of this international business and how tied we are into that, ladies and gentlemen, we have given up our liberty and our internal security for the insanity, insidiousness of economy. And that's what our founders were battling with. That is exactly, that is exactly what they dealt with when it came to fishing, to tea, to trade, to bringing things in from where? From out of, uh, out of the Caribbean. Oh my goodness gracious. Our trade was controlled by internationalists prior to the American Revolution. It was controlled in such a manner that we were being stifled. We could not produce our own goods. Remember, I've talked about it over and over and over again, that we had to offshore. We had to take our raw materials and send them to England to be manufactured and then sent back to us with what? With taxation tied to it. We paid double, if you will, for those products. And it was a control mechanism. It was a means by which England was enslaving America. We couldn't have our own banks. We couldn't have our own currency. We couldn't even determine our own taxation. Ladies and gentlemen, today, Congress is determining our taxation. But because of our administration, we are being tied severely to the internationalists, especially through, once again, not conspiracy, Go read and understand the treaties with the UN. Go read the UN Charter and its documents for yourself, and you'll find that we are enslaved by virtue of what is happening in our own time with our own Congress 
under this Constitution. We'll come on back in the next segment for Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalists Got It Right, here on Liberty Works Radio Network. Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to this next segment of Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalists Got It Right, here on Liberty Works Radio Network. Once again, I need to remind you that this is a listener-supported network, and I would encourage you to go to the website at uh, www.lwrn.net and follow that. Take a look at uh, what all is going on on the network and uh, find that link to the opportunity to support the activities that are working very hard for your liberty. Again, this is Tom Navolis, your host. Uh, I am traveling, so you'll probably hear some background noise and not the clarity that I normally have in uh, my uh, recording booth uh, back at uh, my home studio. So with that, I wanted to continue with you today in talking about, uh, let's see, liberties that uh, we have given up for economy and uh, what's going on in, in, in a lot of stuff. I mean, we were talking about the jihadists. We were talking about what is happening in our government uh, today, the administration. We have uh, all of the foreign influences that have been coming in and affecting us. But uh, we'll get back to a, to a number of those areas. One of the things that I do have to take you back to, though, is something that uh, Sam Adams wrote. Uh, as he was talking uh, and developed, actually, in a resolution within the Continental Congress back in 1778. Uh, it's, it's interesting that he was asked to write this resolution, uh, and I'm, I'm just impressed. I'm not hearing this coming out of our Congress today. As a matter of fact, everything that comes out of Congress is a total antithesis to what I'm going to read you right now. So Adams wrote this resolution that was then sent out to all of the other states in, in the new nation in November 3rd, 1778. And these are from the papers of the Continental Congress. It, having pleased Almighty God through the course of the present year, to bestow great and manifold mercies on the people of these United States, and it being the indispensable duty of all men gratefully to acknowledge their obligations to him for benefits received. Whoa, stop right there. You know, if you tried to say that in the public square today, you would have the ACLU coming down on your ears if you would have this coming out of any local state, or the National Congress at all, you would have the jihadists coming after you. You would have every communist, humanistic group coming after you, just on that first paragraph. Ladies and gentlemen, this was presented from Congress to the states. It having pleased Almighty God and they're talking about the God of the Judeo-Christian Foundation. And, and the whole course of the year, 1778, we were at that completion of everything that was happening in the American Revolution. We saw a number of things that happened. And we were claiming in this the manifold, the great and manifold mercies of that God on the people of these United States. And it being their, your, mine, the nation's indispensable duty of all men, gratefully to acknowledge the obligations to him, that God of the Bible, for the benefits that we received. Be it resolved that it be and hereby is recommended to the legislative or executive authority of each state of the said states to appoint Wednesday, the 30th day of December, next to be observed as a day of public thanksgiving and praise. Whoa, stop! 
Yeah, we have Thanksgiving, but that's in November. Wait a minute. This was a Thanksgiving on a Wednesday, the 30th. And what was it for? Not just a day of public Thanksgiving, but of praise. To praise God. The God of the Bible. Not any other God. Not any other religion. It was the God of the Bible. Okay, so, as I continue in this resolution, that all the people may, with united hearts on that day, express a just sense of his unmerited favors. Oh my goodness gracious, this sounds like something that would be preached in a Reformed Baptist, Presbyterian, or whatever Calvinistic church that uh, that's talking about grace. God's what? His unmerited favors. You can't work for it. You can't do it by any other religious means or methodology. It is his unmerited favors. Continuing. Particularly in that it hath pleased him, who, him, God, by his overruling providence to support us in a just and necessary war for the defense of our rights and liberties. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a re right. We have the right to defend our rights and liberties. And that was even reserved in the Constitution of 1787. We have that right. We have the Second Amendment for that right. We have the First Amendment for that right. We have the amendments, which are being killed by the 14th Amendment and the 16th Amendment and the 17th Amendment. Those rights are being destroyed by virtue of what those do, as well as all the other stuff that we've become involved in. But we have that right to defend it, and even by war. By offering us seasonable supplies for our armies, by disposing the heart of a powerful monarch to enter into an alliance with us and aid our course, obviously that was France, by defeating the counsels and evil designs of our enemies. You see, that's something we don't deal with nowadays. We don't call evil evil. We don't call what is coming out of the likes of the jihadist evil. We don't understand that. Our founders clearly understood biblical God, Judeo-Christian perspective, Reformation perspective of God, and of evil. Okay, So by defeating the councils and evil designs of our enemies and giving us victory over their troops. And by the continuance of that union among these states, which by his blessing will be their future strength and glory. Now, I'm going to take a real jump here. You see, George Washington wanted to make sure in the Continental Army that we had Christian ministers there for the purpose of keeping the people, the, <clears throat> excuse me, for the purpose of keeping our troops focused on the Savior. That's what he did. And to keep morality and virtue at a very high level because he knew that's what it would take to have an army that would defeat the designs of the evil enemy. Because if the army was evil, if the military, the navy was evil, you know what? Evil to evil is like, okay, we're just spanking one another because everybody's evil and you're never coming to any resolution, nor do you have any purpose for why you're engaging in the battle. So I'm going to take a real leap here, and I'm going to tell you right now, we're putting evil in as Secretary of the Army. We're putting evil in a lot of the high places within the administration. We're not just putting it there. We have evil there. 
and we have to call it evil. And so what we need to do is look at the evil that is within our own nation right now. So, oh my goodness gracious, how do we expect then the future strength and glory of this country or the blessing of God based on allowing the evil to perpetrate everything that we have? I'm sorry, but continuing. And it is further recommended that together with devout thanksgivings may be joined a penitent confession of our sins and humble supplication for pardon through the merits of our Savior, so that under the smiles of heaven our public counsels may be directed, our arms by land and sea prospered, our liberty and independence secured, our schools and seminaries of learning flourish, our trade be revived, our husbandry and manufacturers increased, and the hearts of all impressed with undismemberable piety, with benevolence and zeal for the public good. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to take a moment to take you back to that. What's being recommended not only was the thanksgiving, but whole joint confession of our sins and humble supplication for pardon through the merits of our Savior. Now, wait a minute. This is coming out of Congress. This is being absolutely specific to the fact that there is evil. And guess what, folks? You and I have that. We're sinners. They understood this. In Congress, understood the idea of the nature of sinful man and the fact that we needed pardon by a Savior, and that Savior being Jesus Christ, as they absolutely understood the Scriptures and the Reformation. Ladies and gentlemen, this is very, very significant in what was coming out once again when this came out as a resolution in 1778. It was very, very clear that if this nation is to continue, we cannot allow the perpetration of evil. So that goes to the extent of what's going on in Congress right now in talking about infanticide. When you're talking about murdering babies that are unborn, that is, that's murder, all right? That is evil. And we've been perpetrating evil in America. And once again, what we need is exactly what our founding fathers called for. They called for confessing our sins and having humble supplication for pardon through not anything we can do, not through humanism, not through trying to do good, not through trying to raise all the taxes to give to all these foreign entities and all of these insurgents that are coming in as, what do you want to call them, uh, refugees. They're insurgents that are coming in as refugees. No, that's all evil. No, what we're supposed to do is look not at what works we can do, but to lay ourselves before the merits of our Savior. So that what? So that under the smiles of heaven, our public councils, that being our Congress, our city councils, everything may be directed by him, that our armies and sea, our navies can prosper, our liberty and independence secured. Ladies and gentlemen, the security of our liberty and independence is in the fact of who we are as a people before the living God. Then our schools and seminaries of learning can flourish and our trade can be revived. It is only under the protection of heaven, as our founding fathers understood that, that our hearts would be impressed with piety, with benevolence, and zeal for the public good only through confessing our sins, and the merits of salvation through Jesus Christ. Now, isn't that interesting that that would come from where? That would come from Congress. Ladies and gentlemen, let it be resolved in your heart that we may be purposeful in this area as we look at our liberties and what our founding fathers were talking about when we continue this discussion here on Samuel Adams returns the Anti-Federalist Got It Right on Liberty Works Radio Network, where liberty works for you. And yes, this is your host, Tom Navolis, and I so much appreciate you being here today. 
as we look to the Savior and confess our sins so that our rights and liberties will be secured in him. Thanks a lot, and see you soon in the next segment. Segment. Welcome back once again to Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist Got It Right here on Liberty Works Radio Network. And yes, this is Tom Navolis, your host, and I am absolutely delighted that you're still with me in this segment. This is a third segment for this evening, and uh, boy, I'll tell you what. When we take and we go back, and I just want to recap for you a little bit of uh, what I was talking about in that last segment. I was talking about the resolution that uh, Samuel Adams was the author of back in November 3rd, 1778. It was about a, a, a public day of thanksgiving and praise to the God of the Bible. And it was so that uh, the people would be united in our hearts on that day so that we could get God's unmerited favor. By how? You know, you just can't get it by doing any good works. You can't do it by being a humanist. You can't do it by being a communist. You can't do it by being a jihadist. That's not how that works. You see, the way that grace works, as our founders understood from the Reformation biblical perspective of who God is, it has to come by grace, which is his unmerited favor. And even in the detail, for the securing of our liberties, one of the things that Adams brought out in here is that we needed to take and jointly, as a nation, confess our sins. That we had to be supplicant before God for the pardon of our sins, not by any works, not by any flagging yourself or flogging yourself or doing any type of uh, uh, penitent type of thing. It was by taking a true-hearted confession based on the merits of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. That's what Samuel Adams was writing about, the merits of our Savior. That means what he did in not only dying on the cross, but in the resurrection. That's what Jesus did. That's what he was talking about. That's what our nation understood as this came from Congress. So I'm just taking you back to that. Then the whole reason on that was so that heaven would smile upon us, God would smile upon us in our public councils, and that he would direct them. You see, that's what the founders understood, is that very clearly is what they understood is that it wasn't a divine right of the king, it wasn't some uh, council of men, it wasn't Congress, it wasn't the parliament, it wasn't a president, it wasn't even the Supreme Court. It is God who rules. And every human being, every leader in particular, is subject to him and must bow down before him. I mean, you could go back and look at the stories, if you will, which are not stories, they're biblical truth, about Nebuchadnezzar. You can look about uh, what happened uh, with him. You can look at how he had to crawl around uh, as an animal based on the predictions and the dreams that he had and the interpretation that came from Daniel. Leaders, yes, are put up, and a lot of it is is because the people do not take and confess their sins in such a way, nor do they request that in humble supplication, the pardon based on the work of Jesus Christ. Now they try to fix it on their own. Let's see, if we pass another law to do this, maybe we'll get that and, you know, things will happen and it'll all be good. And no, we'll rework this. Oh, we'll do gun control because that's what we have to do to make everybody feel good. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. That's not how it works. How it works is based on what I talked about in the last segment. It works on exactly what Samuel Adams was writing about here in this resolution, is that the only way that our armies by land and sea will prosper is how we confess our sins and look to the merits of the work of Jesus Christ. Our liberty and independence is secured on that. Our schools and seminaries don't work on common core Nope, 
They only work as we understand biblical truth and return the Bible into the schools and get rid of the nonsense of this international garbage called common idiocy. Um, anyway, that's what the last segment was about. So I've taken about five minutes of time to give you that. So if you want our nation to succeed, our trade to be revived, you want to see our, 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 our farms growing great, and our manufacturing increased, then we have to impress in our hearts what it means around piety, benevolence, and zeal for the public good only through the merits of Jesus Christ. Wow! Sorry, jihadist. You can't have your Sharia in America. I'll tell you what, Ben Carson's absolutely correct, and so is everybody else that's saying that Sharia law does not belong in America. So Mr. Obama, Mr. Muslim, you can take that and all the communist Muslims that you have in the White House and get out. Go away, because you can't have it here in America. Uh, so with that, what I want to go on to is that if Sam Adams was taking and leaving as governor of Massachusetts, he wrote a letter to the legislature. And it was real interesting that in part of that, he was talking about where George Washington was retiring from office. He, he did not take and accept the nomination, and the election happened at that time. And uh, he took and he says, you know, and he's not going to stay. And so Adams was, you know, 80 years old, and he was retiring as well. So the whole point in that was then, what do you talk about? And, he, and, and what he talked about was this exactly, is that by the late returns of the votes for the representatives to serve the Commonwealth in Congress, that meaning Massachusetts serving in Congress, there were several districts in which no choice had been affected. In other words, they did an election, but nobody got elected. I immediately issued precepts according to the law requiring the several towns within those districts to meet on a day now past in order to complete their elections. Get it done, folks. You need representation. I cannot but recommend to your consideration whether it may not be necessary more effectually to guard the elections of public agents and officers against illegal practices. You understand that? All the voter fraud that we've had in America lately? All elections ought to be free, and every qualified, qualified elector, that means each citizen, a qualified elector, who feels his own independence as he ought, will act his part according to his best and most enlightened judgment. Elections are the immediate acts of the people's sovereignty. You understand that? In which no foreigners should be allowed to intermeddle. You see, you can't have an illegal vote. You can't have a foreigner vote. You can't allow the insurgency through the guise of, uh, what did I call it the last time? What are they calling it? Uh, all of these people that are coming in here. Oh, refugees. Insurgency through refugees. Can't allow it. You know why? Because our free and public elections will be perverted. We need to have laws in place that protect them. So you can't have foreigners that would intermeddle in our elections. Upon free and unbiased elections, the purity of the government and consequently the safety and welfare of the citizens may I not say altogether depend. That's what depends, is that we have security, our safety, our welfare, everything is on unbiased elections, secure elections, with not the intermeddling of foreigners. If we continue to be a happy people, that happiness must be assured by the enacting and executing of reasonable and wise laws expressed in the plainest language, not 400 pages that we read later, and by establishing such modes of education as tend to inculcate in the minds of the youth the feelings and habits of piety, religion, and morality. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's stop here a second. It's not Common Core where we make people slaves to some job because that's what industry needs. No, ladies and gentlemen. Our purposes of education in establishing that 
as to what inculcate in the minds of the youth the feelings and habits of piety, religion, and morality, and to lead them in the knowledge and love of those truly republican principles upon which our civil institutions are founded. And I don't mean the Republican Party. I mean that which is the republic to which we have been designed. We have solemnly engaged ourselves, fellow citizens, to support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of this Commonwealth. This must be recognizable in the mind of any man who judiciously considers the sovereign right of the one as limited to the federal purpose and the sovereign rights of the other as acting and directing the internal concerns of our own republic. Ladies and gentlemen, he just laid it out right there. He laid it out, not from some libertarian nonsense, because I'll tell you what, my libertarian friends, I am going to irritate you at the moment, because pure libertarianism is nothing but anarchy. With Samuel Adams, some people say, oh, Samuel Adams was a libertarian. No, he was not. Samuel Adams was a Reformation Puritan that understood the principles of republicanism as a republic and how that all works. So here we have is that the federal government is limited, which in modern days we know it is not. It is a monster, it is a brute, it is a tyrant, especially with this administration, and that the sovereignty lies in the people and in the states. So, you know, there, there are those connections, but, you know, let's press on a little bit. So Adams was continuing in his letter. He says that, uh, you know, we have been under apprehension of being made a party in the desolating contest in Europe. Permit me just to observe that the, the first and main principle which urged the, the combined powers to enter into that contest, they were supporting the war and, and what was happening in France and, and all of that that was going on between France and England again, uh, and, and Adams was against that. And, and the whole idea is this, is that it is my opinion, unsupportably by reason and nature, and in the violation of the most essential rights of nations and of men. The repeated acts of violence which have been committed on the property of the American citizens might, in the opinion of some, have justified reprisals. But the policy of the federal government has directed to other measures. The wisdom of our councils, with the unexampled success of our magnanimous allies, the Republic of France, afford the strongest ground of hope that under the continued smiles of divine providence, peace and tranquility, so interesting to a rising republic, will in the end be firmly established. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a lot there. In other words, there's this whole theory that I have not even gotten into, which Samuel Adams clearly understood, which is called, what is just war? And what was happening going forward in France and what was happening again between the war of England and France in that later period after the Constitution was not just. And we cannot enter, and which we have not entered into a just war in America since the War of 1812. I'm sorry. That's a whole nother discussion, but that, in fact, is what it is. We have not been in just war. You know, so in the pursuance of the provisions of the Constitution, the people have recently exercised their powers again on another president. Elections to office, even in the smallest corporations, are and ought to be of the highest exaltation of a free people. And, and he gets into this even more, ladies and gentlemen, which I'm not going to have time to get into, but it is on a fair and uncontrolled elections depend under God that the whole superstructure of our government. You know, if it becomes corrupt, if you have foreign entities, if you have foreigners, he talks about it very, very clearly here, that you know what happens? Is our nation falls apart. And that's what we have going on. We're bringing again, I'm calling it insurgency by refugees is what's going to take and continue to bring jihadists into America. We already have a lot of evil here. Let's call it evil. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get to the point of what he talked about and what I mentioned again. We need to repent. We need to take and come before God, the God of the Bible, and ask for his forgiveness 
so that we may have his security and his prosperity and those blessings that heaven wants to give to us in a nation that will serve the living God, understanding who the Savior Jesus Christ is for all that will serve the public good. Thanks again for listening to Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist Got It Right, here on Liberty Works Radio Network. Network.